Okay, hello everyone. Um, we can start the afternoon session. I hope you're all uh, full up and well caffeinated and things. Um, but yeah, we'll be. Uh, I'm, I'm Dr. Sam Moore. I am the scholarly communication specialist in the library, um, and I am very happy to be introducing this panel on uh, open research in the glam sector, which is the galleries, the libraries, the archives, the museums. Uh, as they're, they're more sort of practice-based disciplines, um, and so the glam sector is often kind of overlooked in the turn to open research, um, despite them being kind of integral providers of access to knowledge, um, glam in, uh, resources and, and expertise. Um, glam institutions are, are designed to provide access to a range of audiences and to think about those audiences um, very carefully and very intentionally. Um, much glam research is also co-created um, often kind of with minoritized or underserved populations in mind um, and with them, um, which creates both opportunities and kind of risks in the turn to open research. So, so what then is the, is the kind of relationship between the glam sector and open research? That's what we'll be talking about today. We have um, four expert speakers. Um, they're going to go in order, um, alphabetical order, and then we'll have questions at the end of, of all of the presentations. So save them up and we can ask them at the end. Um, so I'll just introduce all four of them now, and then I'll invite Mary to the stage. So firstly speaking will be Dr. Mary Chester Cadwell. Mary is a senior software developer at Cambridge University Library and lead research software engineer for Cambridge Digital Humanities. Mary has a PhD in the landscape archaeology and material culture of early medieval England using computational methods. She advises researchers on the technical aspects of projects, works on a wide variety of software, and teaches coding and software engineering practices. Next will be Dr. Aisha Fuentes. Aisha is an, uh, an objects conservator and currently Isaac Newton Trust Research Associate in Conservation at the University of Cambridge Museum of Archaeology and Anthropology. She has an MA in the Conservation of Archaeological and Ethnographic Materials from the UCL Getty, Getty Conservation Programme, and a PhD from SOAS, um, from 2021 where she wrote her dissertation on the use of human remains in Tibetan and Himalayan ritual objects. Next will be Dr. Agustina Martinez-Garcia. Um, Agustina leads the, leads the Open Research Systems team within Cambridge University Library. She leads the development of Open Research Infrastructure Roadmap that is part of a wider Open Research Programme led by Cambridge University Libraries. She's also responsible for the development of Cambridge's institutional repository, Apollo, that we all know and love, um, and integrations with other systems and services to support researchers making their research outputs available in ways that enable greater discoverability and reuse. And finally, Dr. Amelie Roper is the head of research at Cambridge University Libraries, leading a small team that fosters collaborative research relating to the library's collections. She's also an AHRC RL UK Professional Practice Fellow, working on documenting the role of UK science in the COVID-19 pandemic. Prior to joining Cambridge University Library in 2019, she worked at the British Library as Research Development Manager and Digital Music Curator. So if I can invite Mary to the stage. Thank you very much, Sam, for that introduction. So um, today I'm gonna talk about the ways that I interact with researchers and research in the context of open research practices. And in terms of the research that I collaborate on, there is often very little distinction between digital humanities and library special collections, practically speaking. So I'm gonna kind of conflate the two in my talk today, because I know that we are focusing mainly on GLAM, but for me, those two things are very closely related. And when I use the word researchers, I mean that in the most the broadest sense. So that could be anyone involved in research from PhD students pursuing their own research, curators or postdocs embedded within a, an institution, a GLAM institution, or indeed anyone else who's using library collections, for example. So I'm actually going to focus on the teaching that I, I do in various contexts, but most notably for the Cambridge Digital Humanities Learning Program. Um, and my personal interest is principally in open research practices as they pertain to coding. So that's what I'm going to talk about. Um, you've already heard a little about me, but I just wanted to sort of emphasize that I have a humanities background, but uh, I've worked in a variety of different 
uh, spaces before I decided to become a software engineer or a software developer. So I actually have quite a mixed background and I've come into it from a slightly odd angle. And I think that kind of gives me uh, an interesting perspective. So I want to give you a little flavor of a few of the principles that I teach, which will help you understand the challenges and opportunities I'm going to talk about in the second part. So I like to often start my workshops with a little bit of self-reflection on what is code actually anyway. It helps to frame what you actually choose to do with your code, and it may well be the first time that the participants have ever really spent a few minutes thinking, what is this stuff I'm actually creating? Code can be anything from some slightly embarrassing scripts that you have on your own machine and you hope that no one will ever see, all the way through to something that could actually be citable, it could be published, it could be public, it could be reused by other people. So code has a variety of different origins and it has a variety of different endpoints, I suppose you could say. And what that is, what you decide your code is, really determines how you apply open research practices to it. I like to ask people to think also about the code in terms of the biography of their projects. So humanities and collections-based research have a variety of different forms. It might be that the code you create is something you do while you're working alone, and that might be, for example, if you're a PhD student. It might be that the code you're working on when you did your PhD then turns into a project in which there are more than one person. And then you may need to do something new with your code, such as share it or show it to other people. It may be that your project becomes much larger and you start collaborating with others in different institutions and those people also want to write some code with you. And then you have a new problem of making sure that everyone can contribute to that particular code. And then at the end of your grant, you then wish to publish your work. And it might be that it's appropriate to publish the code as well. But code is not just a thing that you publish at the end and leave. It's something that other people may want to be able to run, for example. So it comes with a bigger baggage, as it were, than just a book that sits on a shelf. And that's all about sustainability. So I ask people to think, where does code fit in with my research project? I also try and um, reassure them <laughs> that there is no such single thing that is going to make your research code good. It's not like somebody's coming along, looking over your shoulder and tutting, that's terrible code, because it really isn't like that. There are different types of best practices you can apply to code. Does it run well? And we're talking about for yourself as well as for other people. Does it work? Is it understandable? You come back in six months, can you understand your own code? And can others understand it? And if you do choose to share your code, how are you going to allow access? Because it's not just enough to put in an email. You also need to license that code to say, in what way can somebody use it? And which of those things you choose very much depends on what you're trying to achieve with your project, how much time you have available, what resources you have. And what I ask people to do is simply make an informed choice, be selective, choose what works for you. What many people, of course, do is they don't make any choice. They don't realize they need to make a choice, and they end up in a position where they wish they'd made a choice two years ago. So make a choice. So these are some of the things that I teach. I'm not going to go through this in uh, detail. Um, I do think that one of the most important things that anyone can do if they do coding of any kind is learn to use version control, which is simply a way of keeping track of the history of the changes of your code. And this is an incredibly valuable practice that really is the foundation of everything else you might want to do with your code in the future. I also cover things like documentation, refactoring code, which means rewriting it um, and that enables everything else, again, you might want to do. 
And then, of course, there's the piece around sharing, collaborating, publishing, licensing, and things, which is perhaps quite well known in other contexts. I also like to talk about FAIR for code. So we're very familiar, or at least we may might be very familiar with findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable in the context of the main body of data for a research project. But code is also a kind of data. It's not the same kind of data, but it is a kind of data. And it's very much something under current discussion within the software engineering, <coughs> research software engineering community. But that's a big ask for, to, see, to expect researchers to engage with that very intense discussion that's happening. So I like to offer a few simple things that simple things that they can apply, which will actually move them forward and move them towards fairer code. So I want to talk about three challenges that I have observed while uh, engaging with the very great variety of researchers. Is it all a bit too sciencey? <laughs> I think we've heard a little about that earlier, but Open research concepts themselves are designed, first and foremost, to be really very sciencey. They derive from the needs of scientific research, and in my field, research software engineering comes directly from those working in science, so it makes sense, they're sciencey. The concept of fair data is very positivist. It um, it's all about objective knowledge that's created by independent facts that are derived by logic from observation. This is, this is a very specific viewpoint. It assumes that data is neutral, and sharing it with others is simply sufficient to be fair and in the sense of transparent and open to those who want and need it. And as we've heard today throughout this conference, this can be deeply problematic from not just a theoretical perspective, but also from the viewpoint of gatekeeping from the, of the global south. So there is a really big challenge here over how we effectively apply these things to code within the humanities and collections-based research. The second thing I face is something a little more um, concrete. Um, in my work, I come across people working who come under this digital humanities collections-based research from a very wide variety of disciplines. This is a selection of a few departments that came to one single course that I ran last academic year. And I am only research trained in archaeology, and although I have experience of museum and library collections from my career, I really don't know enough about the way that knowledge is generated in a huge variety of other subjects. I don't know enough about how that, the quality of that knowledge is generated or validated. I don't know enough about the types of data. I don't know what are the open access journals, and I don't know necessarily where is the right registry to put your, um, to put your metadata so that people can find your stuff within your own discipline. Of course, we have Apollo, which is, uh, um, as I'm sure you will hear shortly, a very important centralized place to put all of your code and data. But are you necessarily going to be advertising your work in your discipline to the right people just by doing that? So what I do is I ask participants to take these principles and consider for themselves what is appropriate within the context of their discipline. I refer them to the Office of Scholarly Communications where there are courses and expert staff who know perhaps much better than I do what is the right thing for you in your subject. And it, I think it's a work of a lifetime to basically become an expert in every subject. <laughs> so I'm not going to be able to do that. But it is a genuine challenge that I face. And the third thing I wanted to talk about is something that I think is not particularly unique to humanities and collections-based research. Um, I was talking to some science-based research software engineers yesterday, and they assured me these are the same problems that they also face when um, collaborating with scientists. But I think it's quite important to just talk about these things. Once you've perhaps worked out what is the right thing for you as a researcher in the context in which you work, you then have to figure out how you're actually going to change your day-to-day -day routine to accommodate these things. Oftentimes you realize 
that you should have started to do these things in the first place, like version control, for example. If only you'd started to do that two years ago, your life would be so much easier. And then once you start, you have to get into new habits and make it stick. You have to start thinking, for example, about your code differently so that you can group the changes that you make into little logical blocks and so that you can make commits for version control. And it does take a while to get your mind around these changes. Then there are things like writing tests for code, which are the kind of thing that you don't do up front because you're focused on problem solving. Um, but then if you do do it, it's like an upfront investment to improve not only um, the quality of your code so that you have fewer bugs later on and spend less time later on in your research process, um, but it also means that you are less likely to be making conclusions on the basis of potentially faulty uh, outputs. But if you didn't start writing the test at the beginning of your project, um, and then you're up against a deadline, you've got a conference talk, you're not going to start writing your tests now. And then there, is the, then there aren't really those structures that are necessarily there to help you start well and then sustain these practices. So rather than it just being about you and creating new habits and putting the onus on you, it's also about structures, right? So if humanities and collections-based research focuses on particular types of outputs as important talks and papers and things, they are not going to care whether you've structured your code well or done any of that kind of sustainability housekeeping. It's just, you're not going to get marked for that. It's like, no one cares. So that is a kind of structural problem. And then, of course, there are those issues around fair data and other such issues that are very contextual within your project. And you're going to have those conversations throughout the, the life cycle of your project and reflect on the meaning of the data and the way in which it came into existence and the way it continues to exist. So you're not actually going to have a single answer at the beginning of the project to apply. You might not know that answer until the end of the project. So you therefore, there is no best practice. There's what you generate was what you create. Um, so yes. That is my three challenges that I have come across, and I shall pass on to the next speaker. everyone um, and thanks Sam for the introduction and thank you for com you got my name perfectly I really appreciate that okay um, so hi my research is very much shaped by my experience and training as a conservator so this is me at work uh, I specialize in the care of archaeological and ethnographic museums with over 10 years of work in museums and cultural sites here in the UK as well as the, U as, well as the US which is where I'm from uh, as well as China, Sri Lanka, Cambodia, Sudan, India, and Bhutan, which is where this photo is taken. Um, and today, one of the things I want to talk to you about is actually my work as a conservator in the Himalayas, including a recent and ongoing project with the Museum Division at the Department of Culture in Bhutan, uh, as well as the Namgyal Institute of Tibetology in Sikkim. So I want to share with you some of the opportunities and challenges of this kind of collaborative practice-based research, and it is very much practice-based and more than just capacity building, how I really try to use conservation and collections care as a platform for knowledge exchange and for critical engagement with the with actual museum making and what museums can be. So in, in my conservation practice, including my current post at MAA, I tend to focus on risk management, storage, and preventive care rather than res restoration or display. Um, I spend a lot of time thinking about the control of mold, moisture, or insects, but also about access and restitution, um, as well as how conservation can or should facilitate a discussion about the ethics of caring for cultural heritage in a museum context. 
So at MAA, I'm helping to move a collection of about 300,000 objects from one storage facility to another, and thanks to a grant from the All Council Harmonized Impact Acceleration Account, the Rapid Resp Response Fund, um, thanks to a grant from them last summer, I was able to take all of this problem solving, all of this collections care knowledge, uh, and actually work in the Southern Himalayas. Um, I worked alongside local staff to understand their interests, challenges, and accessible resources, as well as their relationship to the collections for which they care. And I should mention that despite a relative lack of formal degree programs in the region, um, and there are a few, they're mostly in India, um, but there is a fairly robust cohort of local conservators who specialize in the care of religious objects and cultural sites. And I've been lucky enough to learn from a number of them, so including that earlier photo that was actually from part of my training. My contribution has never been to introduce anyone to conservation or museum practice, but rather to work together as conservators of these collections and explore what it means to care for them in this context. So this photo is actually the director of the National Museum of Bhutan on the right, a man named Sonam Tenzin, with the museum's conservator, Kamal uh, Pukwal. And this is the only time in my life that I have ever seen the director of a national museum working in a display case, so working as a technician. Uh, one of the reasons we were working on this object was that though Mr. Pokwal on the left is very skilled with paper and painted surfaces, he knew relatively little about the museum's collection of natural history specimens, so we worked on them together for a couple of days. Other practical work includes recommendations for object storage, the mitigation of light damage, documentation, and the distribution of skills and resources amongst local colleagues, so working between institutions as well. Part of the challenge of this particular work is a large st stakeholder interest from local religious authorities and practitioners, including many of the museum staff. They are most often Buddhist, and one of the most interesting discussions that I've had over and over in this region is on the value of material heritage to a religious tradition that teaches about the dangers of attachment to impermanent forms. So for example, is the purpose of an object to remain unchanged? or is it to make ideas accessible to different types of people over time? So it's been very important to develop a shared vocabulary. Uh, I've learned a lot about Buddhism, its regional institutions, as well as its everyday significance. I've also learned a lot about local social and political contexts, uh, its histories, and its complex identities. In addition to shaping my overall understanding of my own work as a conservator, including here at Cambridge, this epistemological context has practical implications. So for example, in a system in which all life is interdependent, how do we manage a termite infestation in a temple? How and when should we use biocides like pesticides, or is it possible to find new ways of working with collections to discourage pest activity? I was discussing this with a monk who also works as a librarian, and he observed that using pesticides could have, quote, far-reaching consequences. Other practitioners have expressed similar concerns about killing species to save collections. At the same time, a lot of my work uh, here at MAA has been looking at the long-term effects of toxic pesticide residues on ethnographic collections here in the UK. So there are also some really great opportunities for collaboration in this context, um, in order, just in, in answer to some of these prompts. Um, so on the left here, you have, uh, these are some of my colleagues, and we're out picking tinge. It's called tinge locally. It's called Sichuan peppercorn. You might know it as Sichuan peppercorn. Um, and we're actually picking it from a tree outside the museum to test its efficacy against silverfish. We're going to press it into an oil, um, which is one of the insects that eats paper. This is based on a local suggestion and was tested against naphthalene, uh, or mothballs basically, which is an imported pesticide. And this was done in order to promote a non-toxic and locally available insect deterrent. So, and then on the right, we're collecting pest debris from some metal sculptures. These have wood in, uh, inside them, which was inserted as part of the consecration process, and this has become infested, so it's not the metal itself, but rather what's inside it. Rather than attempting to treat the wood as historic material, as I might in a museum here in the UK or in the US, local custodians will instead remove the infested wood, replace it, have the clean statues reconsecrated by local religious authorities. So it's a different approach that's appropriate to that context. So I'm a very practical person, and I like the physical and technical work, so I actually do enjoy removing dead termites from sculptures and things like that. Um, but I find that while I'm working on these problems together with my colleagues, we're also having important conversations about the value and the function of the collections. 
So again, this is helping to build a shared vocabulary that makes this discussion accessible to more and different people. So two ways of thinking about this uh, on this slide. There are two, in, in Tibetan and in some Tibetic lesson, uh, languages, there are at least two words for museum. So the one on the top is Kutun Kong, the one on the bottom is Jemtun Kong. On the top is a house for making accessible the body of the Buddha. And then on the bottom, a Jemtun Kong, which is another word used, is just an exhibition house. So you have two very different concepts of what's actually on display in a room, but I see them used interchangeably. Um, another way to think of this is whether or not one removes one's shoes to enter the galleries, as in a temple or in a home. So this is an image of a museum in Sikkim. It was formerly a temple. It has a gallery downstairs with displays of local religious objects and a library upstairs. Visitors, including tourists uh, from other areas in India and abroad, as well as practitioners, uh, are requested to remove their shoes, and there's a space on the porch there where people can store their shoes when they go into the galleries. As it has been explained to me, the shoes must be removed as in a temple or a domestic space because there is a library upstairs, which is an archive that is also a relic of the Buddha. So this is not, only the, this is not the only museum in the region to require that shoes are removed, but it is not as consistent a practice for museum and galleries as it is in other religious spaces. But it is still a way in which we can actually have a conversation about what this building is and what we do in it. A few more practical concerns for critical engagement, just very quickly. Uh, on the left, this is a deity on display in the National Museum of Bhutan. The director told me that this particular sculpture is highly valued by local practitioners who come to make offerings. However, due to pest activity and fire safety, the museum is unable to accommodate food or butter lamps, which is more standard. So instead, they provided a cash box, which you can see this white box down front. They've also worked with local religious uh, authorities to provide extended opening hours on significant days for the worship of the deity. And on the right, another practical concern that really gets to the heart of what a museum is or has been or could be. This is a hanging scroll that was put under glass when this gallery was renovated by a European team a few decades ago. In a local religious context, the same type of scroll would be hanging free or with a textile curtain to protect it from dust. Here, the glass is deteriorating more rapidly than the scroll. And there is a moisture problem that was never seen in practitioner contexts where the same scroll would be displayed in the open. We've had an extended discussion about why this glass, which is extremely difficult and expensive to replace in context, may not be necessary. And I think they are going to try displaying them as in temples without glass for a year or two. And this issue of vitrinization, so of putting objects into vitrines, of taking them out of use and putting them into vitrines, this has been at the heart of a lot of our conversations. So finally, I just want to wrap up with a little bit about where this is going. Um, some of the most rewarding feedback that I got while doing this work for my local colleagues is that it gave them a different, more flexible, and more practical way to think about conservation and museum practice. Rather than an expertise, it instead became a way to investigate their own capacities as professionals. Um, I am very much hoping that they will eventually share their work, and this is definitely one of the biggest problems or challenges, really, is making sure that they get their voices out there. Um, uh, and later phases of the project uh, aim to support a local network for collections care that can be used to cultivate intra-regional knowledge exchange. So instead of having me come over from Cambridge every time, they could actually solve their own problems. Um, at the same time, I hope to make use of my access to resources as a researcher here at MAA in Cambridge and to better understand how these resources here might be more useful to my colleagues in the region. So, thank you. interaction earlier. Um, I'm very pleased to be here today as part of this panel and um, I would like to talk about the work we are doing in the libraries um, to support open research infrastructure. Then uh, I will give you a, a brief overview of the program uh, we are developing and then I will talk about the specific projects that relate directly to publishing and uh, sharing research. Um, very briefly, first, uh, the open research infrastructure work that we are doing at the libraries is part of a wider open research program at the university. And uh, it's some of the parts we lead at the library, but then we collaborate, as you can imagine, with many other different areas within the university. Um, then the vision, in particular, for the infrastructure work, it's around meeting researchers' needs. Um, 
across the full research life cycle. Uh, we talked in the panel earlier about the importance, not only about publishing at the end, but about everything that happens before getting into that later stage. Um, the main vision of the, uh, is, is as well to uh, supply more streamlined and better integrated services for researchers here at Cambridge, because it is quite complex how we work here and everything is very kind of disaggregated. And then it's about developing um, systems and infrastructures are based on open on open systems. That is very important. So I really wanted to emphasize the importance uh, of open in this context, because uh, it's really a key operating principle for us when we are working, uh, we are looking at developing services as system, art and systems for researchers. Um, and then um, briefly here, you can see the three main areas that we are working on, but today I really want to focus on the third one around the open research ecosystem, because it's the one that really aligns better with the main topic of this conference around uh, equity uh, and inclusion by making research accessible to everybody. Um, so yeah, so making research accessible to everybody. You will hear a little bit about Apollo, I'm afraid. Um, it's, it's really a critical part of our infrastructure because repositories in general are about making research accessible to everybody. And more importantly, in ways that are actually reusable and in ways that you can actually in the longer term continue to access and to use those outputs. So um, is the university's institutional repository um, it is underpinned by open software and very well supported by a really large community across the world. Uh, it's based on this space. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, it's, I really wanted to mention here mainly the three main, the three main areas uh, of work that we are undertaking. The first one is about integrating with uh, university systems and beyond as well. And the main, the main goal for that is to really make it simple for researchers to deposit uh, their outputs and making them available. So that is really a very important part of what we do. The other big area is around continuous improvement and making sure that uh, whatever we do, we adapt to the really changing requirements of funders and as well as like in general, uh, the scholarly publishing landscapes as well. So I really wanted to mention here a project that we are very proud about, which is uh, the Court of Seal certification uh, that it was mentioned earlier in the panel. It's been really three years of very hard work across many teams within the library. And this really demonstrates uh, that uh, we have really robust uh, curation practices in place with the repository and that you know, the Apollo content is actually preserved for the long term and uh, more importantly, not only accessible, but also usable in the long term because it's not about access only, it's about ensuring that in the long term you can still actually reuse uh, the outputs. And then a third area of development is around ensuring that the content is discoverable. We heard earlier in the morning about fair principles and then a lot of the work that we do through supporting persistent identifiers, making sure that Apollo content is discoverable through main search engines such as Google Scholar, Google, that is really also a, a big part of what we do. And then uh, repositories, I wanted to give you kind of a sense about that, you know, the role they play actually within the wider uh, open inf scholarly infrastructures. Uh, they are really one of the key players there, uh, in particular around service data providers. Uh, they basically provide really rich data with, with uh, rich metadata, uh, open data, uh, through, for example, programmatic APIs, so that you can access all of the data and the metadata programmatically, but more so they are actually used by global services that are open and that are allowed to discover and search across together millions of publications together with other research outputs. So it's not only about publications, about um, data, data sets, about funding information, all of those things together. Uh, so in that sense, for example, all of the metadata and open content in Apollo, it's available to global services such as Open Air, um, and as well as a core connecting repositories, which is based in the UK, but it's a global <coughs> aggregator of uh, research papers uh, sourced from repositories <coughs> across the world. Another important area is about connecting research, and so repositories uh, are actually, oh, sorry, repositories there are actually can be one of the primary players in engaging with innovative scholarly initiatives, such as, for example, Core Notify, which is about connecting preprints, content in repositories with uh, peer review services, as well as, um, for example, overlay journals. Uh, and then, I wanted to talk a bit about some key projects we are undertaking. Uh, some of them make use of Apollo, like a preprint service we are launching uh, in January. So it's about supporting the publish, review, and curate model. And uh, the primary use case for this uh, service is to support Cambridge researchers 
who do not have uh, available to them uh, because of their discipline, uh, any other preprint servers uh, out there, community-based, that they can use, so it's to support them uh, primarily. And this, uh, this service will also allow us as well, uh, well, we will make use of Apollo for that, and the main purpose for that is to make it really easy for researchers because they will be using systems and workflows that they are already familiar with, and that makes it easier for them if they wish to publish their content in that way. Uh, yeah, so another project uh, that we will undertake is uh, the Office of Scholarly Communication is currently leading a research project that is looking at Diamond open access journals across the university. Uh, interim findings uh, suggest uh, that there is a, a healthy ecosystem of those journals, but researchers have expressed that they would like some technical support, in particular, around uh, publishing and preservation activities. So for this, we are looking at uh, undertaking a complementary uh, um, technical project that will provide uh, open solutions so that they can actually publish their journals in that way. And uh, the idea is like during a year, we will explore with researchers, we will promote, engage with them, showing them what the platform can do. And then we will also would like to, to look as well as uh, whether the open platform is actually a uh, fit for purpose and we were looking at part in particular at publication workflows, uh, content management workflows. And then lastly, uh, we would also like to see about what it takes it from pilots into uh, service uh, activities, basically. So we need to look at any resourcing required, uh, any kind of technical infrastructure, what are the costs, those kind of things. So it's, that's what we were looking at uh, initially. And then I want to finish with two kind of two projects that we are not leading, but we are collaborating with. The first one is about connecting the Octopus platform with research repositories. I won't describe uh, Octopus in, in, in detail because uh, after the, this panel, team will be presenting in full uh, a workshop around it, so you, you learn about it then. But I wanted to mention that we are collaborating with the Octopus team to connect Octopus with Apollo so that uh, the content in Octopus can then be preserved for the long term in, in the repository. So we will use Apollo for that. And then, very briefly, we are also participating with the next um, iteration of the COPIM project, which is looking at uh, preserving uh, open access content from small presses to ensure that if the presses uh, cease to operate, the content still uh, remains, um, remains uh, available. And then, just very briefly, uh, just to mention kind of key points around the role of libraries in advancing open practices, um, we really should be active partners in research and, and by providing appropriate open and community supported uh, infrastructure. It's not only about uh, the, the systems, but it's also about the people. So for that, advocacy, support and engagement activities with researchers is also really important. And then lastly, it's about supporting and participating more widely with the, uh, with the scholarly uh, communities. And we already do that by um, engaging with the different user groups communities and, uh, and by supporting those open systems. And that, yeah, that would be all. Thank you. everyone. Um, it's a real pleasure to be with uh, you today. Um, so in my presentation, I'm going to offer some reflections of my experience of open research practices in the GLAM sector from three different perspectives. So I'm going to consider, first of all, my experiences as an arts and humanities researcher. And then I'm going to think a little bit about um, my experience as a, GLA as a GLAM professional practitioner, so in my case, a librarian and a curator. And finally, offer some reflections as a research manager. So in other words, somebody who helps other researchers to apply for research funding and to manage research projects. But before we get started, I thought I'd make you do a little bit of work and ask you um, a few questions, at least those of you in the room. Um, so I'm going to ask um, a series of short questions and I'd like you to put your hand up if you feel this a question um, applies to you. So first of all, how many of you would class yourself as an arts and humanities researcher? Okay, so it looks like about a third of the room. 
you can put your hand up more than once. I should have said that. <laughs> um, and how many people would you do? You, how, how many of you would think that you're a researcher in another discipline, so a discipline that's not arts and humanities? Okay, two hands. So that's a small one. Okay. Um, how many people in the room would think of themselves more as a cultural heritage or glam professional? So working in some capacity in a gallery, garden, library, archival museum. Okay, that's about half the room. And finally, um, how many people would class themselves as a research administrator or a research manager? Okay, so I think we've got one or two hands. Okay. So I've been really fortunate um, in my career so far to um, have undertaken roles that span all three um, of these areas. So arts and humanities research, cultural heritage professional and research manager. So I currently work as head of research in the university library um, and manage the new U university library research institute which launched in May as a centre for collections led research. Prior to that, I worked as a librarian and a curator in several academic libraries and at the British Library in a variety of different roles. And I'm also active as an arts and humanities researcher. So my first degrees were in music, and then I went on to do a PhD in book history, looking at the culture of music printing in Germany in the 16th century. And this uh, research took a collections-led re approach in other words, um, the printed sources produced in the region that I was looking at formed the basis of my research. And that led me to engage with lots of different libraries, archives and museums and to get a, a perspective on, on what it was like um, from, from a, I suppose, from a researcher's point of view. So, um, I should begin by saying probably that I'm fully committed to the principles of open research. I really believe that cultural heritage should be publicly accessible and reusable in some form, wherever possible. And, and the, the same should apply to knowledge derived for it. But I've also found that there are challenges in achieving this. And I'm now going to offer some reflections on some of these challenges and um, how my various roles have intersect, uh, intersected with open research practice. So, first of all, to think about my experience as an, an arts and humanities researcher. So I suppose I engaged with open research practices in terms of data acquisition and data creation. So in my sort of field of research, that meant um, creating my own uh, digital images of printed books and using digital images of, of other people other, uh, that other libraries had created. So availability, resolution um, of images and clear conditions for access and reuse were really vital. I also worked a lot with catalogue data or metadata, by which I mean descriptions of the primary sources I was working with. This was an, um, important not only to enable me to find materials, but also to analyse publishing at scales, patterns at scale. And there was another aspect to this kind of inter interaction with metadata that was important as well. So sometimes in my research, I was creating data that could have been used to enhance existing catalogue records. And my experience was that the pipelines to enable this kind of, these kind of findings to be fed back into library catalogues, um, museum catalogues, etc., are not very well established. Um, and I also work with two other types of data. So data about how specific items in GLAM collections had come to be acquired. So what led them to get into the, the libraries, archives and museums that they would, were in. And data about um, what conservation treatments particular items had undergone. And this data was rarely openly available. And there were often no clear, clear pathways to obtaining it other than relying on personal contacts and sort of favours. When it came to analysing my data, I was often reliant on open source software for things like visualisations and image recognition. And in terms of data sharing and reuse, I had to decide obviously where and how to publish. <coughs> now, I completed my PhD in 2017 and I was lucky that in the kind of lead up to 
um, completing my PhD, I had, through the research group that I was working with, various options to publish. Now, in one sort of that were very easily accessible to me, and in some ways, this was, this was excellent. I didn't have to go out and look for opportunities. But in, the, in, in um, another sense, it meant that choices were taken away from me. So the, the first places where I published were not open because that, that was not what was, was offered to me. And at that stage in my career, I didn't have the knowledge or really the confidence to kind of um, grapple with that and perhaps think about other options. So I think that's just something, I think things have improved since 2017 when I was finishing, but I think that's worth um, kind of bearing in mind how those sort of dynamics of power can um, influence how you come to publish your research outputs. And obviously I was also having to balance other things in terms of how open um, I could make my research outputs in terms of university funder regulations, cultural heritage organisation regulations, publisher requirements, so lots of different things meant that it, it was not all under my control. So now a few um, reflections on my experiences as a librarian and cur curator. And you'll notice that um, lots of these are kind of quite similar to my experience as a, as a researcher. So I've been involved in creating data in various categories and have also had the opportunity to influence how that data can be made available openly via catalogues, digital platforms and institutional repositories. And I've also found that various factors have come into play in terms of how possible it has been to make data accessible and reusable. And a key one of these is funding. For digitisation in particular, commercial partnerships can be really enticing in terms of getting collections online, but these can come with restrictions on quality in some cases, and in almost all cases, the extent to which images can be accessed and reused. There may also be targets for income generation linked to imaging li image licensing. Another really important factor is time. In particular, it takes a lot of time to clear rights, um, and that can make it really tempting to digitise only collections that are out of copyright, or where it's easily, easy to obtain clearance. Mm. This also links to legal restrictions, or legal considerations, which again can influence what can be digitised and how that material can go on to be used and reused. I'm thinking in particular here of the restrictions around accessing non-print legal deposit collections, also the technical challenges of collecting materials that mean that it's sometimes hard for um, librarians and curators and other cultural heritage professionals to collect and make materials openly accessible, even though they may um, very much want to. And the final thing that I wanted to highlight is appetite for risk. Quite often, there are risks to balance when you decide how open um, to make um, cultural heritage data. And I find that often um, we're quite risk averse as a sector. Finally, I'm just going to offer some thoughts um, as a research manager. So I've been fortunate to be involved in the setup of the new University Library Research Institute. And this means that we've had a real, real opportunity to kind of model open research practices into our own activities right from the outset. So, for example, that's really kind of small things like making sure our images are fully credited and licensing statements um, are included in all our, all our sort of publications and, and outputs. And other things like making sure when we're writing and, and showcasing the work, uh, the research that goes on in the Institute, making sure that we're really highlighting and laying bare the contributions of everybody involved in the research, so not just the lead researcher, but the conservators, the developers, the heritage photographers, and so on, so that all of those contributions are really clear. We've also had the opportunity to embed support for open research practices into our strategic and operational planning. But unless you actually do something about that in practice, that can be just words. Um, so what we've tried to do to kind of take that 
kind of words in the strategy documents and operational planning uh, and make them sort of act, uh, actionable, I suppose, um, is to work with researchers when we're designing, um, when we're working on funding applications with researchers, to have discussions about open research with them, to have the conversation, to have the confidence um, to have those conversations um, so that we can encourage those sort of things to be um, built in right from the beginning. Um, to When we're doing the project management for projects, also to, to see the extent to which what was promised in the application then goes on to be delivered as well. And of course, to signpost researchers to other expertise in the university, of which there is a lot. And then in terms of other factors that I think have influenced my intersection with, research, uh, with open research practices as a research manager, I think it, the same sort of factors come into play, amount of funding, time, and of course, funder compliance influencing what you, what you may and may not do. So I'm just going to conclude now. So having looked at open research practices from these different perspectives, I think what we've highlighted is the intersections, the common challenges and opportunities to work more closely together. As a research manager, and given the theme of inclusivity, I'd like to leave you with a question, which is, are we doing enough to include research managers and administrators in discussions relating to open research culture, particularly those who are working with the researchers day to day on the costing and designing of research funding applications? Thank you. So um, thanks, everyone. That was wonderful. And um, we're now going to, I guess, we've got 15, 20 minutes for some questions, um, so I can open it straight up to the floor and online as well. Yeah, Neve is at the, uh, the front here. Thanks, everyone. Is this working? Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, good. Uh, thanks, everybody, um, for all of your presentations. Really interesting. Amelie, I'm going to come back to you on that last question, because I think by asking the question, you're implying that you don't think enough is happening. And I think that's really interesting, given that ARMA have an open research group within the Association of Research Managers and Administrators. So really interested in your experience. Um, my, my perspective is that there are silos, not enough crossover, but I'm really interested in hearing more about why you asked that question. Yeah, so I suppose I asked that question because I think at the point that projects are being um, planned in detail is often at the point at which costs are being um, put together. And I feel like often the, the people who are involved in those kind of tasks either don't have the confidence or maybe don't think it's there in their remit to kind of ask those questions about open research. And I feel like that's opportunity being lost, really. Um. Anyone else? Well, I, I, I scribbled a load of notes so I can, I can ask a few. <laughs> um, well, I mean, everyone talked about um, kind of the, the labour um, that goes into care and maintenance and conservation. And I mean, you talked about time um, and, and these kinds of things. To, to what extent do we think are, um, is open research kind of at odds with all of this work and the kind of the, the supportive work that goes on here? It's, it seems much more supportive than when we often hear about kind of the output driven nature of open research. And yeah, I'd be interested in anyone's thoughts on that question. I can maybe start with uh, the role we play in terms of the infrastructure and the systems we develop. The idea is to really try to have those systems available to researchers so that actually we try to minimize a bit 
the, the kind of the things that they need to do, but also how long those things take. Uh, that's why I was mentioning one one area is around trying to bring in like you know the, the research life cycle from planning to the actual doing the research. There is a big disconnect across all of the stages at the moment. So trying to bring services and systems together, we think can help with that. But you know, it's about adoption. We can try and bring all of the systems. We can have the repository, but if if we don't work with researchers to make sure that whatever we are doing, it really meets their needs and simplifies what they do. It's, it feels like that is also a barrier. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, like to have a, a go that. Uh, I don't know, I feel really out of place right now. Um, I think time is an issue. I think more than anything, as someone very practice based in terms of like the real like sausage making of museum making like I build the thing and I put the thing on display time is an issue management is a bigger issue um, and I think that's something that definitely probably relates to everyone in this room is just like an integration of workflow and the fact that if you're at one point you don't have the information that's accessible at another point and that that can be very frustrating so streamlining those processes so we actually know where they are is really helpful but I think, in my case, the biggest barrier for having more open research is just that there's no financial support for people with my skills to do that kind of work. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a whole sphere of knowledge production and you know, <laughs> mutual liberation that's just not being tapped into. Mm -hmm. um, and for me, that always seems to come back to just trying to find the funding, because it always does sound like a good idea. So it's never time so much as um, funding, whatever you want to make the relationship between those two resources. Mm -hmm. I mean, oh, oh, we have a question over here actually, I'll take that one next. Um, my question mainly relates to um, Mary's talk at the start. Um, I think the, I very much agree about as a software developer about all, all the stuff you've said, um, and to me, really, what that comes down to is is fostering the concept of reusability, uh, rep um, reproducibility. Um, but I think that even as a software developer, we, we probably both agree that reproducibility is not always very easy. You know, when you have multiple data sources, you know, there are, there are really clear sort of mindset skills you need about organising data, developing a, a, a workflow, um, all these kinds of things that are not necessarily always very natural to a lot of people. Um, so I wonder whether the, you know, the, whether we're actually setting our expectations too high sometimes, and that we we sort of to some extent have to accept that reproducibility won't be achieved, or do we somehow make sure that specialists who are able to help with that kind of thing are built into research grants uh, applications so that that can be done? It, it seems to be a very difficult dilemma I think at the moment until the tooling is so much better than where we are in terms of the state technology at the moment. <laughs> Yes, I think it depends, it's a very good question, I think it depends on the nature of the research. So if you are a lone scholar type PhD student, um, then I think from my perspective I would like to see them engaging with these issues perhaps for the first time, uh, perhaps looking into making those choices that I talked about. Um, that are deliberate choices um, informed by the available resources such as the Office of Scholarly Communication or myself or any other research software engineer working in the space. In terms of grants, um, again it depends slightly on exactly what the grant is about. So some grants are um, the researchers themselves have a deep background in, say, computer science. They may have dual majors or they may have more than one degree in different areas. And they are better equipped to know how, where to look and how to do these things. But a lot of the research that I work on is working with researchers who have almost pure humanities backgrounds. And they really don't know what they should know. So in that case, you are looking at having a research software engineer or a 
technical type research assistant being costed into the grant to make sure that those things can and do happen as best as can be. Uh, in terms of perfectionism, <laughs> of making it all perfect and ticking every box, I think I would say that sometimes it isn't clear what the boxes need to be that need to be ticked. But I certainly think that we can aspire to do better in every project. Um, yeah, I don't think there's a, I don't think there's a perfect answer for that, um, other than to keep striving for better. I think we have a question online. Yeah, this is an online question for Aisha. In terms of sharing the knowledge, practice and experience, how limiting or even intimidating are the conventional channels and what and ways and formats of publishing presentation and language? Okay, how limiting and how intimidating? Was that? that yeah, that's right. Lovely. Thank you for that. Whomever wrote that question, that's wonderful. They're horrible. <laughs> They're absolutely horrible. They're insufferable. Um, I mean, when you look at... So let's just take conservation, not even museums as a sector, but conservation as a technical discipline or collections care even, and just trying to like, like the, the idea to someone who maybe didn't finish high school and is working in a museum and doing a wonderful job of being a custodian of that museum, the idea that they could you know, answer a call for papers, let alone know about a call for papers, let alone like present something online or any of these things, like just even being able to articulate things in language or put a PowerPoint together is, it's, it's not, you know, it's completely, what is that? So even trying to communicate the format for what that should look like, like that even is something that we have to talk about in these collaborations, because it's like, what's going to be useful to them but may also facilitate an engagement with the greater global museum community. Because I do work with you know, the International Council of Museums and things like that, and so I, I'm aware of like, what our output, what our idea of output is versus what the local idea of output is. So, and it's, it's a, an ocean of epistemological, technical, economic, social, et cetera, literally every difference that you could possibly consider. So thank you for that, and um, it's something that really needs to change within our professional organizations. So thanks, online person. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Um, I, so two things I wanted to talk about. One was the point, Mary, you were making about soft, costing in software developers, and I think the university needs to catch up to costing and job descriptions because it's very hard if you're writing, for example, a research software developer position, I'm thinking my experience in archaeology, that the role templates don't exist and, and the, the salaries haven't caught up, so it's very difficult to hire competitively for software development. So I think that's something the university really needs to start thinking about seriously. Um, but what I really want to ask was about, about language um, and about the F in FAIR, the findability. Um, so I've noticed, because Apollo does have a, a little language button and you can... Um, browse some of the term many of the terms in many different languages um, are available in the interface but it's not a full translation and I wondered about whether there's is there a process to have for example um, the keywords in a, in a standardized dictionary that can then be searchable because I think it's you know if you to fight to signpost people who are working in an additional language um, to at least find the resource. Once you've found what you're looking for, then you take the time to translate it yourself or read it. But that, that instant findability, I mean, it's great. It's obviously built into Apollo and has got so far, but where is it at the moment and what, what's in process to kind of really make that fully searchable in, in multiple languages? You yeah, know, that's a good question. No, you're right. At the moment, it is accessibility is a big area of work for us as well next. Um, and at the moment, it's only the actual user interface that has the translations. So no metadata term that you have, uh, any of the, the data we have in machine readable formats are not translated either. Uh, but yeah, that will be a massive piece of work. Um, but it's one actually that we are looking, we are starting to look at, the, is still looking at the user interface and trying to actually improve the navigation, how we structure content, how we organize it. So the other, the part of the translations, it's something we should consider. So thank you for the question. Can I answer the other part of the question, which was around the costing people into grants? 
Come and talk to us at the library. We do it. We have uh, job descriptions. Me or Emily or both, both of us um, probably help. Uh, in terms of the um, competitiveness with industry, I think that's going to be a challenge. But in, certainly in terms of job descriptions, we, we have a good um, experience of that. Hello. Um, probably just following on from the question prior to that last one, um, I'd just like to thank Aisha for your talk, which um, I think really uh, kind of uh, opened up new ways of thinking about how we do research openly, not just in terms of um, the kind of systems and um, uh, the kind of standard outputs of uh, research in terms of publishing. Um, so, sorry, I don't have like a perfectly formulated question here, but maybe it could be, you know, to kind of uh, then expand on the question that Amelie left us with. And given that we know that half of the audience, at least in this room, are glam professionals, um, I wonder if we need to do more to kind of facilitate conversations between uh, practicing glam professionals about open research in a in a kind of broader way, um, yeah. Anyone like to? I just want to say that like, thanks, but also just any research in from the glam sector, and I think mm -hmm. it's a it's a huge especially for those of us who work as technicians who work in collections care. We aren't curators, and I think anyone would assume that most of the research output in the glam sector is coming from a curatorial perspective. And it is so frustrating because we have so much capacity. We have so much to contribute. And maybe that is who we need to be talking. It's like, maybe I need to know, have a better relationship with the research manager so that they're the one who says, hey, maybe you should ask a technician, you know, and that they could write us into that or something. It's like, so I do think it's that not even just open research, just research in general and the fact that it always seems to come from, you know, one part of the museum. So I think that's a, that's a bigger issue and I hope that that's something we talk about, yeah. I think that's, that's really true. And um, what, we try, what we're trying to do, um, with, at least with projects and grants that we're de developing with the Research Institute, is to get all of those people round the table at the earliest stage that the project is um, being looked at. For so, for example, at the moment we're working on a grant on um, paper, and we've got the expert on paper from the English faculty but we've also got conservators involved, curators, we've got the charity sector, the paper foundation but it takes a lot of time that's the thing and that's not a reason to, for not doing it but I think that's often why it doesn't happen because building those relationships and reaching that common understanding and understanding uh, what everyone has to bring to the table doesn't happen overnight um, and often deadline you know they're pressing deadlines and things that mean that you cut cut corners um so yeah yeah just to add like i've been lucky enough to work in um as a librarian kind of embedded in institutes where i've worked closely with colleagues in museums and currently at the botanic garden who you know people who curate living collections and museum collections and it is really like those people doing that work every day that have knowledge to share that should be done openly. And I think those kind of like non-school institutions within the university often get missed from, from these kind of discussions about open research, especially when they're, um, yeah, just framed in terms of uh, like compliance and, and to do with like research outputs like publications. So, um, yeah. Any other questions? Okay, I, I'll ask one more and then I think we can, we can conclude. Um, but so, I mean, it, can we be, is, is there sort of an optimism here that perhaps because we're not necessarily expected to publish as part of, like formally publish as part of sort of our, our glam careers, is that, um, does that offer a chance for experimentation in how we share results? And we don't have to funnel them down the kind of the traditional publication route. Can, can we see that as a kind of as a positive thing? Anyone have any thoughts on that? 
I think it's a definitely a positive um, thing, the ra- range of different types of outputs that we can contribute to. I suppose one thing um, that I come across a lot when trying to um, encourage cultural heritage professionals to be really involved in research projects is confidence, having that confidence to, to know that I, I have a voice here, I have expertise here. And some of that is linked to um, things around publications, kind of um, perceptions that you need to have, you need, in order to be put into a grant, you need to have a publications list. And that is breaking down. So I think there's two sides to that question, really. Yes, we can definitely contribute to lots of, and lead lots of different forms of publishing. But I think there is still often in our, our heads this kind of... Uh, a kind of um, perception that those outputs somehow aren't as good mm, as yeah, others. Yeah. Um, and, and whereas actually more traditional researchers could be looking at us and, and sort of saying, actually, yeah, this is a more interesting way of doing it. Can you can you stop judging me on the, the other stuff? Yeah. But, yeah. Anyone I just, else? I was just want to say that's exactly the position that I'm in because I'm, even in my professional organizations where they're talking about publications and stuff, I'm like, this is obsolete. This is, this is not sustainable, and it doesn't have anything to do with my job. Tomorrow I'm leading a handling session with a textile study group. It's just a local group related to the Cambridge Guild of Dyers and Weavers. That's output to me. Like, that's, that's good. And I don't care, like, in terms of if it's a refable paper or not, or if anyone even makes a video. Um, I'm very proud of that work, and we're going to do that work regardless. So, yeah, exactly. It's really up to the, you know, those who are keeping track of it or who would like to know to catch up to us. As far as I'm concerned. Any other comments? No? Sasha's putting oh, my, yeah, my hand where we can. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, just to say, what, what are you sure what you've just described? Um, uh, we now plug for Apollo. <laughs> but one of the, um, and actually for Tim's um, talk later, is one of the kind of new publication types that we now that can now be deposited in Apollo is a method and so that could be conceived of in like the broader sense you know traditional kind of protocol in Mm -hmm. terms of scientific protocol but it could be something to do with how you handle a precious text (laughs) what you do with it how you treat it but what you just described says to me that the work that you do fits really nicely into that category um, as a non-traditional research output, great, yeah, and and a way of sharing it beyond just within the MAA um, or within the places where you work, and that is a publication output in its own right. It will get a DOI or mm. appear in your publication list and so on, but it's 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 meets your expertise in terms of exactly what it is that you do. We also have a blog post about methods on unlocking research, which was published. Thank you. (laughs) If anyone wants to find out more. Um, Just a quick one, because obviously I know you want to finish. Um, Just building off of that on talking about methods um, and sort of less traditional academic ways of disseminating information, would you then view that work as a different form of open access, just non-traditionally? And would you then view that as perhaps more accessible to someone who's not coming from the academic realm and wants to engage in these, in these sorts of activities? No, yeah, absolutely. And um, to follow up a little bit on Sasha's, um, I didn't mention in the presentation, but for example, in Apollo, there are so many things that are actually nothing to do with open access publications and traditional journals. There's quite a lot of collections, some of them from the library, some of them relating to the digital library as well. Uh, And, you know, we treat them all in the same way. And the important thing is to make them available out there, irrespective of the type and the audiences. So we already do that. It's just like, yeah, we we need to get better at fully advertise the kind of things that we, we actually offer. I would just say, on the ground, when you're actually doing that object-based work, absolutely. And that's a huge motivation for me. That's one of the reasons why I like to do it, is because you can engage with objects in a way that many other people can't. Um, Yeah, I always think of my granny, because she was great with her hands, but she didn't graduate from high school. So that's a huge motivation.
Okay. Um, I think that, that we can end it there. I think we're going for a break now, a 30 minute break, is that right? Yeah, 30 minute break and we, we'll come back and if we can acknowledge our panellists. Thank you very much.